just want to welcome those of you that are watching online, and I'm, my hope and my desire is that the presence of God is just as thick wherever you're at as it is in this room this morning. And so we're just so thankful to have you joining us today. Just want to welcome everybody. Glad you're here today. I want to open up with a story real quick. Yesterday, uh, it was beautiful out. I went out for a run, did about six miles or so, and uh, I know it doesn't look like it. Thanks, Blake. Appreciate that. <laughs> He's my motivator, you know. Um, but uh, anyway, so I was out running, then finally I get back. It was beautiful, but I was drenched, right? I mean, I was drenched in sweat. One of the things I do afterwards, uh, instead of just going into the house and just sweating everywhere, I sit on my back deck and I just kind of cool down. And one of the things I was doing was I was just sitting there and I began to drink my water, my liquid IV, that kind of stuff. And then I kind of looked down and I could just see a puddle. Some of you are like, this is so gross. Why are you doing this? But when I saw that puddle, the God reminded me of the verse where he talks about how he lavished his love upon us, where it's just, we're just cons- totally covered in the love of God. And I say that to start off today, because the topic we're gonna be talking about as we continue our series called Bait of Satan, it's gonna be a painful one today. It's gonna be a hard one today. Uh, really, this series is kind of probably hard each week, depending on, because we're just talking about some real things because over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, the bait of Satan, what happens when offense comes in our life and how we deal with it and how if we're not careful, it becomes we wanna be uh, kind of rage towards that person or we, get, we turn away. But today, the offense that I'm gonna be talking about is when it comes from our father, when it comes from maybe our earthly father or when it comes from someone that's supposed to be a mother to you but yet they didn't treat you right. Or maybe it's coming from a leader. Pastor Matt talked about that uh, kind of our first week, our expectations, and we kind of have this scale where we hold certain people up to certain levels, and then if they offend us or do something to us, the fall just seems harder. The pain just seems more. And that's what happens when those are in leadership or those that are supposed to be our fathers, supposed to be our mothers, supposed to be our leaders, offend us or let us down. So the story I'm gonna be kind of looking at today is the early days of David, uh, when between the relationship between David and Saul, and mainly just talking about what that looks like for them, uh, because even starting off, David, uh, you know, the Bible talks about him being a man after God's own heart, right? We should wanna be people after God's own heart. It says it in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says, then when he removed him, talking about Saul, he raised up for them David as a king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. So here it is, David is a man after God's own heart, and the attention we're gonna talk about today, it literally starts in the very beginning, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, as you see, this is where him and Saul's life really become intertwined because of the prophet Samuel. So the prophet Samuel shows up to Jesse's house to anoint the next king. Jesse brings out his seven sons, lines them up. Samuel's going down the line and realizes, nope, nope, not him, not him. And we can pick the verses up here in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 10 through 13. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So I asked Jesse, are these all your sons you have? There's the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. I will, we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought to him. He was glowing with health, had fine appearance and handsome features. Kind of like me, I'm just kidding. Um, I had to, right, had to. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day uh, on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. But let's recognize how David must have felt in this moment. His father didn't even consider him a son. He brought all seven of them and left him in the field, didn't tell him about what was going on. You wanna talk about the offense of a father? Could you imagine that relationship where his father overlooked him? His father didn't even consider him even an option? Some of us may have felt that way at times. Maybe our boss, that promotion, a family member, even your own father or mother, or maybe even a leader in your life, where you feel like you've been overlooked. But one of the things we can gather from David, and we'll see throughout the rest of the story here today, is he may have been overlooked by his earthly father, but he was handpicked 
by his heavenly father. He was anointed to be the next king. Now that's how David's journey to the palace starts, is him being overlooked by his earthly father. But now he's in the field tending the sheep. He's anointed to be king. He's probably almost maybe small enough to not even understand what's going on, but yet he's in the field and he's tending to the sheep. Now Saul, he's the king. He began to have these like terrors, these evil spirits would come around him and just really mess with him. And he asked his servants, can somebody go find someone to play the harp to relieve me of the spirit? And one of the people in the palace vaguely knew about David, but hey, remembered, I'll go find David in the field. He knows how to play the harp and I can bring David in and he can play for you. And so he goes and gets David. David comes to the palace, begins to play the harp and the spirit and the tormenting of uh, King Saul begins to receive some relief. So now David's in the palace. He's obviously in good standings with Saul. Things are getting a little bit better. David's back in the field. He's delivering food to his brothers on the battlefield facing this giant called Goliath. He was kind of like DoorDash for his brothers. He was bringing food from the house to the battlefield. And he finds out that no one's willing to go out and fight Goliath. They're scared. You see, David been in the field not only tending the sheep, but singing to his heavenly father and growing in his intimacy with him. So he got to the point where he knew I didn't have to fear because God is on my side. And he obviously kills Goliath. And then we kind of end the story there with the slingshot with the kids. We don't tell them that the next part of that story is he goes over to Goliath, picks up his sword and chops his head off and carries it around for a while. Like this kid, he was not just a little, you know, soft kid writing songs on a hill and now he's a, he's a warrior. He went from the sheep field to the battlefield and God used him in a powerful way. And yet, literally overnight, now everybody knows who David is. And David is growing uh, in his popularity within the country. David really becomes close to King Saul. Obviously, we can see why. Uh, he bit, not only makes... Get, kind of gets a seat at the dinner table with King Saul, which is a huge thing. He becomes, in referencing his uh, being an armor bearer, so he's like one of the trusted people in his life. Uh, and not only is he an armor bearer, but he kind of puts him uh, in a high ranking over the military. And so things are going well for David. In his mind, he's like, I'm getting close. I'm in the palace now, but one day I'm gonna be king. And King Saul has allowed me in and this is the guy that, yeah, one day I'm gonna replace, but he loves who I am. I mean, the story is going according to plan in David's mind. Anybody love music? I love music. I'm terrible at playing music. Nobody likes my singing but me. Like, nobody around me likes my singing other than Jesus, right? Like, I just love music. You ever pull up to a red light and you look over and there's somebody in the corner just banging on those drums up in the air and they're just having a good old time in their car? Sometimes that's me during worship every once in a while I'm driving. But everybody, we kind of have this idea that music can just kind of change our mood sometimes. Some of you, you know, I can play a certain song. I should have had a song queued up, but play a certain song and you just start moving, start dancing, or you play a certain song and that music begins to bring back memories. You know what I'm talking about? That, that you kind of remember, oh, I remember listening to this song when I was in my car in high school or blah, 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 right? Or you remember that song from the dance or whatever it may be, but music can help and even sometimes change our mood. Well, there was a song that was played that King Saul did not like when they came back from the battlefield with David. We're gonna pick up that verse here and we're gonna read it together. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse five through seven. It says, whenever asked uh, David to do, David did it successfully. So Saul made him commander over uh, men of war. He appointed uh, that was welcome to people by Saul's uh, officers alike. And when the victorious Israelite army was entering home after David had killed the Philistine, women of all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals, and this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. It was a song that changed Saul's mood. He was offended. He was, the next verse even says he was angry when he heard that song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. The enemy knows what song to play to allow offense to come in. He knows what to do 
to get you offended and to get you hurt. But here's Saul, he becomes offended by what is happening and what they're singing and now he no longer likes David like he did before. Even to the point where he was having torments and he was playing the harp and there's even, I think it was twice where he tried to kill him with the spear and David got away. So now David is on the run because King Saul is trying to kill him. He goes to this area, this town is predominantly priests uh, and their families and he gets help, he gets some bread, gets Goliath's sword and he begins to kind of make his way and continue to run because Saul is coming after him. So Saul rallies up about 3,000 soldiers, begins to pursue him, even goes, hears that he was in this town, he goes there, he comes to find out, Saul does, that they helped out David. Not only was he mad that they helped David, he killed the whole town. The priests, their wives, their babies, he killed them all. He literally got this song in his head and the offense that he had grew so deeply in him where it brought rage upon him. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands over and over again. David was on the run. So now David, he's hiding out in this cave with some of his, uh, that guys that he's kind of rallied up for himself. And then there's this opportunity because now Saul and his men come into this cave where there was some water and they begin to relieve themselves and uh, he's thinking this is my opportunity. Even David's men God is handing them over to you. And we're gonna pick that up here in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 24, verse 10 through 11. This very day you can see with your own eyes. Isn't it true? For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of the men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I say, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed. Look, my father. David is still even referencing him in a matter of respect. He had the opportunity to kill him, but he didn't. And he's calling out to Saul, my father, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, I have in my hand, this is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I did not kill you. This proves that I'm not trying to harm you. And I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting me for you were trying to kill me. David in this moment had the opportunity but he didn't, and now he's showing Saul, like, I'm, I won't kill you. I'm, you're, my, you're my father, you're my leader. I will not touch God's anointed. And in this moment, you kind of see Saul recognizes, the Bible even talks about how he kind of felt sorry and he began to talk, and, but then he went back, left him. David was still on the run. Now, Saul hears that song again. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And he gets back up with his guys. They go running after David, trying to find him. And the Bible says they fell asleep. Now, the Bible says that the Lord put him to sleep. And David says, he knows that they're there. He knows that they're sleeping. He even asks for some of his guys, like, hey, who wants to come with me to go sneak into the camp and we can get Saul? And he grabs one of the guys, and we're gonna read that story here. And look at what David does when he gets the opportunity this is in 1 Samuel 26. So David and Abishai, this guy, by the way, a few chapters before that, the Bible says he killed like 300 men with his spear. This guy is bloodthirsty. He is the guy you want on your side when you go to the battlefield. He's just that type of uh, soldier. Went right into Saul's camp and found him asleep with his spear stuck in the ground beside his head and the soldiers were lying asleep around him. God has surely handed your enemy over to you, Abishai whispered to David. Let me put him to the ground with one thrust of the spear. I won't need to strike twice. He's ready to do this. And David says, no, don't kill him. For, I, for who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday or he will die from old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I uh, should kill the one he has anointed. But take the spear and the jug of water beside his head and let's get out of here. So David took the spear and the jug of water that was near Saul's head. Then he and Abishai got away without anyone seeing them or even waking up because the Lord had put Saul's men into a deep sleep. Even when it seems like God is setting up the opportunity for you to revenge, he said, don't touch 
the Lord's anointed. God was testing the motive of his heart. Even when he had the opportunity and it seemed like it was a God thing, is he going to kill Saul or is he gonna remain faithful and his motives being the righteous and not go after that offense? And even though he had the opportunity twice, he could have, but he did not. You see, when Saul has these moments of afterwards, even when he was in the cave and he was kind of apologetic and he was sorry, there's a little bit difference when you're sorry for something and you're repenting. You see, David, not only did he stop and not kill Saul, God is wanting us to live out our lives in such a way where we're not just sorry because we had a bad moment, but we repent and we change direction. We don't just apologize or say that because that's kind of the thing to do, but our heart, our motive needs to be in a different direction. It needs to change. We need to be more repentive than I'm just, I'm sorry. Because we see that in 2 Corinthians, it says this, verse 10, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for the kind of sorrow, but worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. That was Saul. He, had, he was spiritually dying. And see, David could have said in that moment, even my own father overlooked me and now my leader that you put me under, here's my opportunity, I'm gonna take him out. He didn't, he stopped. So how do we remain a man or woman after God's own heart? We first have to understand a few things about authority. You see, we can only have authority if we submit to authority. Ultimately, God is our main authority, but here's the reality is, when it comes to our leaders, or our fathers, figures, or mother figures in our lives, we have to understand that leaders are not perfect. We can hold them to a standard, but leaders are not perfect, and not all leaders are godly. We can have leaders and God's given them the position, he's given them the authority. The Bible talks about how all authority is given from heaven. So those in leadership above us, whether we like them or not, they're our authority. Whether David liked the fact he loved Saul when he was sitting at the table, but now that Saul's trying to kill him, is he gonna have an offense and wanna take his opportunity? You see, behaviors of a leader may not be from God, but their authority is. How a leader behaves may not be godly, but their position is an authority that is given from God. Now I get it. Some of us may recognize, you know what, Pastor Aaron, you don't know my boss, right? You don't know who I work for. I love who I work for, by the way. Just wanna clarify that. Just wanna, don't wanna throw that out there. Love you, Pastor Matt. Love you, Mitch. <laughs> but here's the thing is, there's gonna be times or there may even be moments. For example, me and Pastor Matt may not agree on something and I don't like his decision. Am I gonna go to Pastor Nathan or somebody else on staff and be like, man, can you believe Pastor Matt did blah, 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 blah? Yeah, I can't believe it. And now we're, sh we're sowing division. I've allowed that offense to become divisive inside of me. And now the enemy is having his way of taking the bait. But no matter what the behavior may be of our leader, we have to understand and submit to the authority. The only time you don't have to submit to authority is when the authority is asking you to sin. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bow to this statue. If you don't, we're gonna throw you in. They even said, your majesty, we will not bow. They even gave honor and respect to King Nebuchadnezzar in the moment they knew they were about to die. They were honoring his position. They disagreed with his behaviors. There's gonna be those moments where we're gonna have that in life. And I love that in this time when David is on the run for his life uh, and he's trying to not to get killed by Saul, he even writes this in, Psalms 94, O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. He knew that God was the judge, not him. Saul's killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Every time we bite that bait that the enemy puts in us of that offense from our leader, and it can be painful at times, we have to remember that God is our judge. So God, so David was a man after God's own heart. So what does that look like? How do we be men and women of God's, after God's own heart? 
Well, number one, one of the things we wanna do is we wanna make sure that we're trusting God's justice. We're trusting God's justice, not our justice. David learned to humbly trust God when it came to his enemies and when he became to King Saul. So we're trusting in God's justice and then the number two, we're honoring the Lord. That was the motivation of King David. He was honoring the Lord with his behavior. He was honoring the Lord with even when he had the opportunity and God even set it up for him by putting him asleep. He said, no, I can't touch the Lord's anointing. They didn't show up to the camp to see if they were snoring. They showed up to the camp because they were trying to kill him. But then in the moment he recognized, I can't touch God's anointed. And then waiting on God is number three. When it comes to having a heart after God, so we have to trust him with the justice. We have to honor him, our motives be in the right place. I'm not submitting with a bad attitude. I'm not submitting with being all grumpy. My heart is honoring God and then waiting on God. And here's the reality. You may never see vengeance in your day. God may never perform what you're desiring to happen to this individual that is, you know, this father figure in your life. We have to be okay. But you know what? We're trusting in God and we're allowing him. So you're probably asking, like, where's the gospel in all this? When we see Jesus, he did not come down to seek vengeance for an ungrateful creation. He allowed the evil and the sin to take him to the cross. And even on the cross, he could have asked his heavenly father to vengeance these people and kill them all. But no, what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them for they now not know what they do. Even in that moment, the vengeance that we got from Jesus is when the day he came out of the grave because that's where he overcame the sin and the violence that put him on the cross of this world and that's where we get to live. We get to live in Christ because you're saying to yourself, how does this even happen? Pastor Aaron, you don't know what's been done to me, what's been said to me, how I've been treated. You're probably right. But that's why we live in Christ and our relationship with him you see, David was getting ready for the battlefield out when he was in the field with the sheep. David was growing in his intimacy with the Lord and writing music out in the field so when the time came, he would perform with the right motives and he wouldn't kill Saul. It's in our intimacy with the Lord that prepares us for future trials. It's our intimacy with the Lord that prepares us for when we do get an offense that tries to take its way in in our lives. We can't just say, well, now I'm gonna grow closer to the Lord because I have this offense in my life. It's like, we wanna do that all the way through, right? We wanna continue to do it daily so we can be prepared for when life does throw things at us that are gonna be painful or are gonna be unexpected, especially when you feel that offense or that hurt coming from someone you, that you least expected but yet you trusted the most. It could be from a leader that you looked up to or that you trusted but then you begin to find out, you know what? You hear about this behavior, they say something to you and now you're offended and you no longer want to submit to their authority because of their behavior and you don't want to honor their position. I get it, it's hard. It can be a painful thing when we have to realize that song that's playing over and over again. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It started with that song that led Saul on a path of rage to kill David because he was offended that he wasn't getting the honor. But you know what? You know what David did when he found out that Saul was killed in a battle with Jonathan? He found out Saul was killed. You would think, yes, I got my vengeance now, the Lord got him. Oh, finally, the relief, he's no longer gonna be chasing me. No, you know what he did? He wrote a song about Saul to give him honor. And then he made everybody sing it. <laughs> you see, it started with the song and brought offense to Saul. But even in the end, David wrote a song to bring honor to him regardless of how he was treated. Because he was trusting God, he was honoring God, and yeah, he was waiting, but he even talks about in the song about honoring Saul and just his love for him and Jonathan. Even in that moment, he could have celebrated his death, but he didn't because he honored and respected the position. 
There was years ago, there was about in the early 1940s, I wanna say, uh, there was a kids that were going on a field trip. Everybody loves field trips, right? Anybody love field trips when you were in school? Everybody loves field trips. There's anything we can do to get out of class, right? So they were going on this field trip and uh, they load them up. They're not only just going on a field trip like to the museum, they're going to a different country. They're flying over to Europe and they're going to England uh, and they're going to see all the different places where John Wesley uh, preached and brought revival, just kind of learning about that movement that took place. And so they're going around, they're seeing these things and they're, the kids are learning from the teachers as they're talking about the stuff that they've experienced and here's what happened and they go to John Wesley's house. Uh, and John Wesley, they were showing him around the house and they go into his bedroom and they show his bed and they show him the two worn out spots next to his bed in the carpet where John Wesley would pray, God send revival, God send revival. Very similar to when David was out on the field, he was singing praises to his God. It was in those intimate moments that spilled over to impact the lives of those around him. So John Wesley is the spot they're showing them, they're explaining to him about his life of prayer, and then all the kids are loading up, they're getting ready to leave. What do all the teachers do, right? Don't wanna leave one behind, so they're counting, and they recognize they're missing one. And go back into the house, trying to find where this kid is, probably frustrated, right? Like, here we go, can't find this kid, kind of maybe a little bit stressed. Get up to John Wesley's bedroom, and the teacher hears this little boy saying, God, do it again, God, do it again, God, do it again. And this little boy, his name was Billy Graham. Many of us have heard the name Billy Graham. He's reached hundreds of millions of people with the gospel. How do we deal with this pain that's inside of us when we receive that from somebody that we looked up to in authority or that father figure, that mother figure? We get to our knees and we pray, God, do it again, do it again. Give me mercy new today. Help me to forgive them. Help me not to allow the enemy in to my heart with this offense. God, do it again. God, do it again. God, do it again. And we know the story of Billy Graham of all the lives that he's reached because he was faithful in the field praying when no one was looking. I love how when we learned the story about David and Goliath and how he took the sword and when he got to this priest uh, uh, town, they gave him Goliath's sword. And it's almost like his weapon of choice changed. The Bible doesn't, he probably did at some point maybe use this slingshot again type of thing, but the Bible doesn't reference him using that in battle ever again, but it does talk about his sword. And sometimes in a new season of life, you gotta have a new weapon. God gives you a new weapon and sometimes it comes from your past that he uses to bring victory in your life. And sometimes that thing is forgiveness. Sometimes it's recognizing that pain. I remember a time in my life not too long ago, I've never been hurt by a leader that was, I was submitting to. It was the first time I was overlooked. I was asked to leave, I was put aside. And I thought to myself in that moment with my family, am I gonna be Saul or am I gonna be David and be humble? Despite how I feel about the behavior of my leader, I honored the position because I knew it was given by God regardless whether I felt injustice. Now I'm gonna tell you, I'll be honest with you, I'm telling in front of everybody, I'm being transparent. I ain't across the finish line yet, <laughs> all right? And that's okay, but I'm getting closer to it. And how am I getting closer to it? On my knees, saying, God, do it again. God, do it again. God, do it again. And allowing the Holy Spirit to do its work. Even when there's times in our life we don't understand how this could happen, but it has. Get on your knees. Say, God, do it again. God, do it again. In that prayer intimacy moments with the Lord. So right now, I'm gonna ask everyone of you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm not sure where you're at in your relationship with the Lord. You may not even know why you're here today. I think this is probably why you're here today is the Lord's gonna ask you and invite you. I wanna invite you to begin a relationship with Jesus and to take that first step and say, you know what, today's the day I'm gonna receive Jesus into my life. I don't understand all this stuff yet, but today I'm gonna take that first step 
to following Jesus. I'm just gonna simply ask, if you're that person today and you wanna receive Christ into your life, I'm just gonna simply ask you to raise your hand right now. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Anybody else? Amen. Let's all say this together. So dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning, amen? One of the things we've been doing to kind of wrap up each week is we've been saying a declaration, uh, whether it's Pastor Matt had one, Pastor Dwayne had one last week. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up with me. I don't want us to kind of read this together. We're gonna do our best to say it together. Let's just read this out that comes up on the screen. Holy Spirit, empower me to be a spiritual father or mother to those who need to disciple, love, support, and encourage them. I refuse to allow the enemy to cause me to seek revenge against those who have wronged me. I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed or seek to revenge myself. I will leave justice to you. Father, empower me to be a man or woman that is after your heart. I know I am not overlooked because you see me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made in your image. I choose to stand in the name of God who is the righteous judge. You believe that this morning? Amen. Father, I pray as they go today that you would bless them. Lord, that you would help us to get through the things that maybe have happened to us or been done to us and bring healing in our lives. And Lord, we declare today that we will leave justice to you and your timing whenever you desire, Lord God, because our motive is to honor you and give you glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Love you guys. You guys have a great week.